Well, good morning, everyone. This month, the theme is One with the Whole. And as Reverend Bonnie said a few weeks ago, that's the whole enchilada. The whole shebang. The whole thing itself, as Ernest Holmes would say. And the title of this talk if I got it, oops, is the Mystic Union. Hmm? Yes. Got ahead of it a little bit. And um, I keep coming back to this topic whenever I can, and certainly this month's theme begs for it, because I think that it's actually foundational to everything in the science of mind, everything in religious science. This, this idea of oneness, this, this mystic, really, union. And then I keep coming back to it in part because, as, as the reading said, you have to get it into your consciousness in order to really avail yourself of it. And it's difficult. Words fail us when it really comes to this, this oneness. And so I keep coming back to it, hoping that I will get it into my consciousness, into all of me, that is, not just know it in my head or even in my heart, but to really, to really know it in my gut, you know, to, to, to know it in my bones. That's what you really need in order to really get this, this mystic union and in the hope that I'll help others to also get it that way too. So I'm very happy to, to do it again today. When Reverend Bonnie was up here, she talked about Neil Donald Walsh and uh, an interview that he did in Science of Mind magazine. And Walsh started off saying, we start off in our culture with this separation theology, this notion that God is out there somewhere and we're over here and that, that separates us from the divine. And he says that separation theology leads us to a separation cosmology, that is think, seeing and thinking of things as separate from each other, which leads to this separation sociology, this idea that people are separate. People of different places, different cultures, that we're all separate. And he says this, this hinders us from essentially solving the problems of the world. Now, back in 1980, physics professor David Bohm wrote a book, Wholeness and the Implicate Order. This is an old copy. The new one has this nice butterfly on the cover. Wholeness and the Implicate Order. And David Bohm was a physicist. He wasn't one of these, you won't see his book in the New Age section talking about, you know, with the word quantum in it. He's, he was a uh, student of J. Robert Oppenheimer. He was a Princeton professor when Einstein was there. He wrote textbooks on quantum theory. So he knows his stuff. So when he talks about wholeness and the implicate order, he's looking at it from a scientist's point of view. And wholeness, okay, wholeness is kind of what we're, we've been talking about in general. What is this implicate order that he's talking about? Well, he distinguishes it from what he calls the explicate order, the unfolded order, where everything is sort of out there and, again, separate and looks to be distinct. And he says there's another order that really jibes better with modern physics, and that's what he calls this implicate order or enfolded order, where everything is sort of folded into one, one thing itself, as Ernest Holmes would say. Now... Uh, what I'm going to be talking about here is kind of, to call it esoteric is to put it mildly. Uh, it's, as I say, words fail us. I'm going to be trying to use some pictures as well. But it's going to be a bit of a journey, so fasten your seatbelts. And <laughs> this is your first time here uh, mixing the metaphor a little bit, throwing you into the deep end today. <laughs> so just be prepared. In this book, he says, it is proposed that the widespread and pervasive distinctions between people, race, nation, family, profession, etc., what, what Walsh was calling this separation sociology, these distinctions between people, which are now preventing mankind from working together for the common good, are indeed, or indeed even for survival, have one of the key factors of their origin in a kind of thought that treats things as inherently divided, disconnected, and broken up into yet smaller constituent parts. Each part is considered to be, and those are key words, considered to be, they're not 
maybe really, but considered to be, essentially independent and self-existent. And this leads to what he calls a fragmentation. What he is proposing here, I'm more or less quoting, but changing some of the pronouns, what he is proposing here is that our general view of thinking of the totality of the whole shebang, our general worldview is crucial for the overall order of the human mind itself. If we think of the totality as constituted of independent fragments, then that is how our minds will tend to operate. Again, this is echoing Walsh quite a bit. But if we can include everything coherently and harmoniously in an overall whole that is undivided, you'll hear that word a lot, unbroken, and without a border, then our minds will tend to move in a similar way. Ultimately, and remember this is a scientist talking, ultimately the entire universe with all its particles has to be understood as a single undivided whole. Describing his implicate order idea, in the implicate order, the totality of existence, again, the whole enchilada, the whole shebang, is enfolded within each region of space. The whole shebang is here, the whole shebang is there. The whole shebang, the whole thing itself is here. Thus, wholeness permeates all that is being discussed from the very outset. So you see that Walsh, more or less the day before yesterday, and Bohm back in 1980, we're, we're more or less singing the same tune. And if we include Ernest Holmes, we'll get this, this three-part harmony. Here's what Ernest Holmes says in seminar lectures. He says, religious science is based on, again, it's the basis of religious science, based on the concept that the universe is one system and only one. We believe that each of us is an individualized center in it without being an individual separate from it. In the philosophy of Ernest Holmes, he says, logic and reason compel us, compel us to accept that the universe is a unitary wholeness, but we do not stop to think what this means. That which is one naturally is undivided, there's that word again, and indivisible. Therefore, all of it appears at every point within it which is exactly what Bohm was saying with his implicate order 20 or so years later. In the anatomy of healing prayer, the infinite never expresses itself in fragments. Remember, this is, again, Bohm talking about how we think about it in fragments, but it's not really. It never expresses itself in fragments. There is no such thing as a part of God. In an indivisible unity, all of everything is present everywhere all the time. So here again, we have that, exactly what Bohm was saying with the implicate order. All of, all, the entire universe is right here in this little space here. How can we understand that? What does that mean? What is, again, what is one with the whole? I think when we, when we start thinking about that, we really start off with, from the, the place of part of the whole, right? I'm part of the whole. It's, it's the idea of, uh, you'll see that metaphor of, uh, a wave on the ocean, right? But a wave is part of the ocean. It's not one with the ocean. It's made of the same stuff, but it's not one with it. So if I would, and really, if you say part of the whole, well, that's what those two words mean. You're not, there's no lesson there. There's nothing to learn. If I say that the cushion that you're sitting on is part of the chair, yeah, <laughs> so? But if I were to say it's one with the chair, that's something to puzzle over. That's something to, you have to think about a little bit more. And so I'd like to, as I say, take us on this journey from this notion of part of to connected to, to one with the whole. And as I've said, words are not going to, words are not going to get us there. Pictures may help to some extent. But ultimately, it has, to, it has to be part of our consciousness in the deepest sense. So we're going to use a number of metaphors, some verbal, some visual. And the first visual one, with, it starts off with part of and also has a bit of connected to in it, is that of a disco ball. And this comes from my wife, Kathy. She's, she says she thinks of it as kind of a disco ball where each of us is a facet 
on that ball. So we're all, we're each a part of it, an essential part of it, and connected to it, and connected to each other as well through that disco ball. So that's a start, that's, that's a beginning. From that disco ball, we then have to get to connected to. Now, when Randy Granger was here last week, he talked about Grandmother Spider and how she would put out a thread here to these people and a thread there to those people and a thread there and a thread there, connecting each to all in, he didn't use the phrase, but a world wide web. <laughs> when Reverend Bonnie was up here talking about Neil Donald Walsh, she said that now with that world wide web, with that internet, People from different cultures and different countries and different ways of thinking can connect to each other through that internet. But before the internet, there was the intranet. What is that? It's my word for it. It's actually called Indra's net or Indra's web. Again, going back to Grandmother Spider's web. Indra's net, the Hindu god Indra, although it's a, it's a Buddhist teaching actually from the, pardon my Sanskrit, Avatamsaka Sutra describes Indra's net this way. It says, far away in the heavenly abode of the great god Indra, there is a wonderful net, which has been hung by some cunning artificer in such a manner that it stretches out infinitely in all directions. In accordance with the extravagant tastes of deities, the artificer has hung a single glittering jewel in each eye of the net. And since the net itself is infinite in dimension, the jewels are infinite in number. There hang the jewels, glittering like stars in the first magnitude, a wonderful sight to behold. If we now arbitrarily select one of the jewels <laughs> and look closely at it, we will discover that in its polished surface, there are reflected all the other jewels in the net, infinite in number. Not only that, but each of the jewels reflected in this one jewel is also reflecting all the other jewels, so that there is an infinite reflecting process occurring. So that's connected to and starting to get that one with at least each other. Right? Okay, there, there are separate jewels in the net, but they all reflect one another, and not only reflect one another, but reflect the reflections, and reflect the reflections of the reflections, and so on. An infinite regress, ad infinitum, getting to that, that infinity within each of us. That's the internet. As I said before, words really, I mean, I'm trying here, but words really fail us here. Words, language itself separates. Language separates subject from object. It separates the noun, the doer, from the verb, the doing. It separates the dancer from the dance in a way that reality really doesn't. And pictures help, but pictures too are, there's still a separation. There's still a spreading out in space. What's over in this part of the picture is not over in that part of the picture. What's up high isn't what's down low, even though in that implicate order it's all enfolded into one. And so we work with the visual metaphors as best we can. Another one that I use that, try, that I think gets a little bit closer to that one with the whole is one I used many, as I said, I've been up here a number of times trying to work this out for myself and, and for, for you as well. And one of the ones that I used eight, nine years ago was this picture here. Now some of you will recognize it as being from a Pulitzer Prize winning a book called Gödel Escher Bach, An Eternal Golden Braid, uh, back in 1979. And as you see, there are these two wooden blocks here. And by the way, these are not artist's conception of, these are actual redwood blocks that were carved by the author, uh, Douglas Hofstetter. And you see they're carved in such a way, I wonder if we can turn these lights off maybe, see it a little better? Or not, if that's... <laughs> You see that they're carved in such a way that the blocks cast shadows that are the initials of 
Gödel and Escher and Bach, and also of Eternal Golden Braid. But the blocks themselves are not letters. Letters are merely the shadows that they cast. Thank you, bud. Letters are merely the shadows that they cast. But look at, look at one of them for a moment and notice that it's not a stencil. It's not on just a G or an E or a B on the surface. It's a G, the G-ness goes all the way through the block. The e osity goes all the way through the block. The B-hood goes all the way through. It's not that it's really a G and just sort of manifests as a B in one, in one shadow. It's not that it's really an E and uh, has, has a G as an epiphenomenon or something. It's, it is all of those at once. Just as the thing itself is all of everything at once everywhere. And so I'd like to try a little thing with you where if you would imagine that one of those blocks, whichever one, is that, that whole shebang, the thing itself, the whole enchilada, and that instead of having just three dimensions, it has an infinite number of dimensions. So you can all picture that. Right? This is why I say I keep coming back to it. It has an infinite number of dimensions, and if you were to turn it in, I don't know, the 17th dimension, what you would see is not a letter, but you as that block. You, are, and all the way through, and all of you, not just your head, because you're not a... I won't say it. Uh, all of you as that block, all the way through, what you think of yourself, what, what your mental image of what you are, that's a shadow that it casts in that direction. But what you actually are is the whole thing itself. And if you were to turn it in another, if you look in another dimension, uh, 305th, you'd see somebody else as that thing itself, as the whole thing. You are that thing. It is, he is that thing. She is that thing. And maybe that somebody else is somebody you feel a connection to. Maybe it's somebody you rubbed you the wrong way. Doesn't matter. So the thing itself. Maybe it's somebody that you greatly love or care for. Maybe it's somebody uh, that you despise, even. It doesn't matter. All that one thing, just in different directions, different dimensions of that infinite dimension. And in fact, not just people. A flower. A microphone. Also, that thing itself in yet another dimension. So you, you can all picture that. Uh, if not now, as a meditation, as something to take home with you and think about and work with and hopefully get it. Get that one thing is you, is each thing and everything, the one with the whole. The, the, the Hindus say, tak tvam atsi. Thou art that. You are that thing. You are each thing. You are all things. Moving to another analogy, another metaphor. In this book on quantum field theory, going back to science, quantum field theory, and this is an actual book. On, you know, I mean, it's got equations in the introduction. Uh, it says right at the beginning, every particle... And every wave in the universe is simply an excitation of a quantum field that is defined over all space and time. So you have this quantum, actually for each kind of particle, I think, so like for electrons, there's a field defined over all space and time, and for photons, there's a different field, and for protons, yet another one, and so on. But still, an entire field, and that's what, what that's saying is that every single electron in the universe is simply an excitation of that same one field. Now compare that with Ernest Holmes saying that each of us is a center of consciousness in that one mind. When I was up here yet another time talking about this, instead of talking about gauge invariant fermion relativistic quantum fields, I talked about cream of wheat. 
And I said, imagine an infinite sea of cream of wheat. And instead of saying particles or excitations in that field, they said, everything is a lump in that cream of wheat. Each thing is. Trying to get at, uh, at a more homey picture of the same thing. And I also said that each wave in that cream of wheat is one of us. One of us, because there's that whole wave-particle duality in the, the quantum thing. I was trying to get at that. And again, another analogy is, Ernest Holmes says in Science of Mind and in other places that we all use the one mind, and if we didn't all use the one mind, we wouldn't be able to communicate. We wouldn't understand each other. If I had a truly separate mind from, from Edie's, my thoughts would be totally foreign to her thoughts, and we wouldn't be able to, to understand each other at all. But the fact that we all have the one mind, we all use the one mind and think thoughts into it, yeah. is how we can communicate with each other. And again, there's that physical analogy. Because all the particles that make up my hand are excitations of that one field that are also all the particles in this podium, that's how I can touch it. That's how I can interact with it and move it. That's how I can interact physically with things. So there's that, that again, that metaphor, that analogy of what Ernest Holmes says about mind, physicists are saying about matter. Now, if you look at that, that notion of cream of wheat, what I, what I said back then was, again, that an, the metaphor of an ocean wave doesn't really get you to that one with the whole. And I, so I said, instead, think about a sound wave, a sound wave through that cream of wheat, or through the air. If you think about it, the sound that you're hearing now is one with the air in the room. There's no separation. There's no difference. It, there's no, you know, it's... One is not a manifestation of the other, or an epiphenomenon, or whatever other distancing words you want to use. The sound is the air. The sound is the action of the air, the movement of it. And when Randy Granger was here last week, he asked Mary Lynn to be up here and help him uh, play a chord in order to uh, illustrate a point he was making. And when I was up here that other time talking about cream of wheat, I asked Mary Lynn to come up here and play a chord to illustrate what I was talking about. And when I was talking about then, was, okay, you hear this chord, Marilyn is pressing down four keys, but it's one sound. It's one wave, and you can't, if you were to be able to see the movement of the air, the vibration of it, you wouldn't see in that vibration which note was which, you just see this one wave, this one, this one sound. And I was thinking, to try and come up with a better way to illustrate that, a better picture, and so I'm going to play, actually I'm going to have the computer play some music. And you see that in addition to seeing the instruments, you see this, this grayish uh, zone on the bottom. That will be what the sound wave looks like. And you'll see that as it plays, you won't be able to see in this wiggling which is, which, which is this particular French horn, which is this particular violin or person's voice. You'll see it's all one wave. I'm going to play that now. And when I do, feel free to do some fake conducting, because you'll probably want to. <laughs>
Okay, we can take a on that. So you saw that all these people were singing together, all these people were playing instruments, and yet all you saw was this one wiggle. You couldn't, you couldn't specify which was what. It was all one sound. The, this is, of course, Ode to Joy from Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, and uh, talk about one with, you know, that, that is one with joy, is it not? And the word symphony itself means one sound. That's what the word means. So whether you get the words of Ernest Holmes' undivided wholeness or Bohm's implicate order, whether you can make a picture of uh, that disco ball with all its facets may be shrunk down to a single point so all the facets are one. Or Indra's net with all those infinite number of jewels again enfolded on itself so all the jewels are one, not just reflecting each other. Whether you can picture that, that uh, those blocks as being infinite dimensional, however you do it, remember, thou art that, tatvam asi, you are the whole, not just one with the whole. That's, it's still a separation in language. You are the whole. You are that. It is you. And so you are, and so it is. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't realize that was the end, huh? <laughs> it snuck up on you.